Hi friends, welcome to Raising Lifelong Learners. I'm your host, Colleen Kessler, and this is the podcast where I encourage you to trust yourself and your differently wired kiddos as you help cultivate their curiosity, encourage them to discover the world around them, embrace who they are wired to be, all while helping them discover their passions, interests, and raise them to become the amazing adults they're meant to be. Hey, 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 welcome back. This is episode 238, and I'm so excited for this episode because my good friend Sarah Collins from the Homeschool OT website and the OT is in podcast is back, and we are talking all about handwriting. It's a question that comes up all the time, and she and I have discussed it personally before because we hear the question all the time, how do I help my kid with their handwriting? What kinds of strategies can I use? Is there a great curriculum? And Sarah is going to tackle it from the perspective of an OT. And you are going to love this episode, especially if you have a little one who struggles with their pencil grip or their handwriting or their fine motor skills. All right, so pop your earbuds in and go for a walk, tackle those dishes, whatever you need to do to disconnect from what's going on in your home and focus on this episode and Sarah's wisdom. And let's get on with today's episode. Okay, are you looking for something to kind of shake up what you're doing for language arts? Night Zookeeper just might be the answer for you. We have used Night Zookeeper in the past, but we're back in it this year with my youngest, Isaac. He is just about to start jumping in again, and I'm excited to be able to share on social media some of the things that he's doing with it. But Night Zookeeper is a game-changing language arts program that takes the stress out of teaching because it's fun, it's engaging. Your kiddo is gonna love it because it's different than other things. It teaches your child spelling, grammar, punctuation, vocabulary, reading, and writing through a pre-planned language arts curriculum that your kiddo can use independently I love this because a program like Night Zookeeper frees me up to do one-on-one help with another kiddo while one is doing Night Zookeeper independently. And then, so when Isaac's doing this, he can jump in, he can learn, he can write, he can engage with the word games and the interactive video lessons and the cool, fun, inspiring writing prompts. And then if he gets stuck or he wants to share something with me, he can pause and come get me and I can go help him, but I don't have to sit there and do it all from start to finish. And let me tell you, having some of those kinds of programs in your back pocket when you are a crazy busy mom of gifted, twice exceptional, and otherwise neurodivergent kiddos is a game changer because you can take it on the go, you can bring your tablet with you, your kiddos can access it from the computer in the family room or the laptop on the go or their Chromebook or whatever. And okay, so here's something super cool. Your kiddo is going to get written feedback on their writing from real tutors. So if they need support or they need to be working on something or they need to add some more describing words or they're messing up their punctuation, you don't have to be the bad guy. I know I'm the bad guy often in my house when I'm trying to get my kids to understand a certain concept. And here you have real tutors at your disposal helping you by assessing and taking a look at your kiddo's writing and giving them feedback. Thousands and thousands of homeschool parents have found success using Night Zookeeper to transform their children's attitude towards language art and writing in particular, and you're going to love it. It's perfect for ages 6 to 12. If you've got an advanced kiddo, you could start them earlier on it. If you've got a kiddo who needs a little bit more support with their reading, writing, vocabulary, or other language art skills, you can let them jump back into it or stick with it a little bit longer, however you need to use the program. You've got this. Okay, so if you're ready to say goodbye to the stress of teaching language arts, give Night Zookeeper a try. Just head on over to rll.bz slash night zookeeper. rll.bz slash night zookeeper, all lowercase letters, and you can get a seven-day free trial and 50% off an annual subscription. You cannot beat that. If you can't remember that link, rll.bz slash night zookeeper, you can also head over to the show notes for this episode and find the link there. All right, are you ready? Let's get on with today's episode. Hey, welcome back. I am so excited, as always, to be here podcasting, chatting with Sarah Collins, one of my favorite people on earth, especially in this homeschooling world, but 
for sure, just as, as a person. She's a great person. And if you haven't listened to Sarah's previous episodes, go back. We'll link them in the show notes. But for those who haven't, Sarah, why don't you take a quick second to introduce yourself and let us know who you are? Sure. Well, I'm Sarah Collins, and I am also super excited to be here because the feeling is mutual. Like, <laughs> there's so much love here, guys. So much love on this podcast today. <laughs> so I'm Sarah Collins. I'm an occupational therapist and fellow homeschool mom. I've been homeschooling now since 2017 and an occupational therapist since 2008. I absolutely love both of those, homeschooling and occupational therapy, and to be able to put them together to support other families around the world is just the greatest honor and just such, such, such a joy. So here I am and I'm really thrilled to be back. Yeah. And we'll link to Sarah's site and everything in the show notes as we always do, but Sarah has a brand new podcast and you need to listen to it because it's fabulous. The OT is in and you can find it anywhere that podcasts are downloaded or you can find it on her site again, which we'll link to, but it's homeschoolot.com. So All right. Today we're tackling a topic that comes up for both of us often, and you're a better person to talk about it than me. So I'm going to like punt it over to you because I think that it's common. And I think that as we've talked about before, people tend to handle it wrongly at first, right? Mm -hmm. They're looking Mm -hmm. at the wrong thing. So I'm going to read you. I just picked up the question out of a Facebook group I'm in. I could probably go to any of the homeschooling Facebook groups or member communities that I'm in or that any of my friends run or are in and find a similar question because it's asked again and again and again. So this mama says that my six-year-old is struggling with handwriting, specifically her letters and numbers. I'm not sure if it's because she doesn't understand my instruction or what. Do any of you have the name of a good curriculum to help me get her started in the right direction? Sarah, let's tackle that. Let's Let's tackle it. (laughs) You are correct. It is in every single Facebook group and it's repeated over and over and over and over and over again. (laughs) And with that, I'm not trying to say like, guys, don't ask, don't ask, but because you should. But what often happens is that you get a million different curriculums that are put in there, which, you know, then you are figuring out, wait, do I need to sift through these specific curriculums? Is it a curriculum issue? Or you get the inevitable, well, just tell your child to play with Play-Doh. That'll work (laughs) and build the fine motor skills. And again, that is one piece of the handwriting puzzle. But I would like to just back up and break down because there's so much that goes into handwriting. And for some, it comes naturally, just like for some, climbing a tree comes naturally. And for some, you know, cooking comes naturally, but not for everyone because we all have different strengths and weaknesses. So we need to think about, all right, what are the actual pieces to help? And this mama in that question, I love how she was asking, you know, I'm not sure if it's that she's not understanding my instruction or, you know, if it's the actual writing or the motor pattern. I, I love that. So congratulations, mama, <laughs> like you're recognizing that it is a much more complex task than just make your big line down and your little line across. Mm-hmm. So let's kind of go into what some of those things are. And clearly we can't tackle it all, but yeah. at, you know, as you mentioned, the OT is in new podcast. So every couple of months, I'm going to tackle just one part of handwriting The entire month of March is going to be all March, 2024, where we are right now is going to be all on visual aspect of handwriting. So if that's a piece that you think might be, we'll go way more into depth there. But today I just really want to go through what are some of these pieces. Okay. Yeah. So real quick, I'm not sure when this is going to air. I can't remember the exact date, but regardless we'll make sure that we link to episodes that Sarah's already done. And then we can always update the show notes if this comes out before that whole series is done. So we'll make sure that you can easily, you know, if you're listening, find resources. And before we go on to like all of the the problems and stuff or the different aspects of it, I want to just say to people listening, handwriting curriculums aren't innately bad. And so starting with, starting with, you know, a workbook to work on handwriting Mm -hmm. or or a journal or, you know, those pages with the blank, you know, picture place on top is a great place to start. It's then when you start asking this question, because you're noticing 
that the connections aren't being made from what you're talking about to what they're doing and they're starting to feel frustrated or you're seeing that there's a problem. That's when you want to say, okay, wait, maybe we need to look deeper before I go spend. Here's the thing, moms, you could buy a million different curriculums, but if you don't understand what the actual problem is, you're just going to be throwing, you know, good money away because chances are there's something going on. It's not the math curriculum. It's not the handwriting curriculum. It's not the language arts curriculum. There's a discrepancy in there if what you're doing isn't connecting and working. So notice that something's going on and then evaluate. And that's what we're going to talk about now. So go ahead, Sarah. Yes. Well, I love this. A couple more things that, you know, stuck out as soon as you said that when you're honing in on this observation to figure out the underlying why that's such a good first step. And also, so if you do have a curriculum or you are searching for a curriculum, I may have misspoke. I didn't mean to say or like imply that handwriting curriculums are bad because they're not. They're actually fantastic. I just went through with Rainbow Resources recently on, you can find it on YouTube and we'll, I'll make sure that you have a link to that too, but where I went through with them a bunch of different handwriting curriculums and we talked about the pros and the cons and the negatives and the positives and that's the same thing. <laughs> so we talked about all of that with several different handwriting curriculums. So that might also be a really good resource in looking just at the curriculum side. Okay. So now let's jump forward into the underlying why, you know, as you're observing, I'm going to go through some of these pieces. So if we're thinking motor skills, which inevitably, like I said, one of the, somebody will chime in there with fine motor skills. That is fantastic. But in, you know, in OT speak, what we say is you need proximal stability to have distal mobility, which means your core is what needs to be strong first. So you have to be really stable before your fingers are able to move, before you can, you know, use your hands to actually write well, or even to open containers in the kitchen or to, you know, build with blocks really well. We need that core stability. So how can we get that? Anything crawling, guys, crawling is fantastic. And you might be like, all right, Sarah, my kid's not, you know, one, you know, (laughs) fine. That's okay. There are lots of other ways to do that. If you are climbing a tree, that's kind of the same thing or climb along a log when you're out on a hike or wipe your floorboards. <laughs> you know, I used to, and I still do. I joke for a while, my son who has dysgraphia, he would be wiping floorboards like every day after our morning breakfast. We have our, what we call our coop time. Cause I'm, I'm a big nerd and whatever we, we all take care of our coop. Right. And so he would crawl and wipe the reach across his body to wipe the floorboards and crawl a little farther and reach across to wipe his floorboards. Not because I cared that I really had the cleanest floorboards in all of Pennsylvania, but because we were all working together at that point to handle our house. And that was a chore that really functionally helped him to build his core strength and his upper body strength. And when you're putting pressure through your hands that way, you are automatically focusing some on the muscles that then lend into fine motor control. So we need that core strength. Another way to do that is, you know, writing on vertical surfaces, having something in front of you. So maybe you're writing on a mirror or you have a chalkboard wall, or when my, when we first started homeschooling and I had two little ones. They would be in the bath. We call this bath math. They'd be in the bath. And my two older kids would write on the bathroom mirror for their math so that everybody was safe and contained in the same environment. (laughs) They're getting their vertical surface, their actual upper body strength and math all at one time. So take on math math. (laughs) My kids loved, we had window crayons. Yes. And there's all sorts of different products that you can buy, but we found these ones. I don't remember if it was like a gift or something, but they just washed off really easily with Windex and Mm -hmm. my kids still drag them out to draw on the windows. And yeah, yeah, anything that you could do, you could even do that with dry erase markers on your left doors. Mm -hmm. And then after that, you have to wash the window anyway, which is even more upper body strength in there. So fantastic. All things are good. After we think through our core strength, then we're going to keep moving down our, our arms. And that's where we need to really not just the motor skills of moving things around in your hands, but your actual grip strength. So that could be done with 
anything that you're breaking. So I don't know, go on a hike and play. We used to play Y sticks. So any stick that looks like the shape of a Y, like a wishbone, everyone grabs on, pulls it apart. You know, that is that same grip strength. Then after we have the strength, that's when we can start with motor control. And on my website, which again, I will make sure that we link here, there is a, I called it the fine motor screener. And so it really looks through some of the important motor skills, like how can we see if those muscles are fully developed in your hands now? All right. So we've got strength, you know, I'm, I'm kind of running through this guys, cause I know there is so much, but I want you to have this really simple guide or guidance so that then that way you're able to lean into the observation and know, okay, where should I focus more of my energy? Okay. So we've got the motor skills. Great. Now we need to build some endurance. And sometimes that happens easily. You know, we've got the strength and then the endurance just comes right away. But sometimes it's really that you're writing just tiny little bits or you're, you have enough motor control and the strength there to play one game of something. No, that's okay. Just take your time and acknowledge how much can we do? And we like to say easy plus one, you know? So if one game of connect four, where you're holding that piece in your hand and moving it to your fingertips, that's hard enough. All right, great. So let's add that, you know, one more piece in the, in the connect four board and then go do something else or take a break, maybe come back a little bit, but we, we do not need to push through, push through, push through, where then we're so frustrated that the next day we don't want to do it even a little bit. I think that that right there is what, how we can boil down a lot of the problems we face Mm -hmm. as homeschool moms, right? Because we put so much pressure on ourselves to make sure that everything is tackled and everything is solved. Every problem is fixed Mm -hmm. and we burn our kids out and we burn ourselves out. And Mm -hmm. especially when we're working with a, an issue that is a problem for our kids. We want to make sure we're not burning them out on the problems. We want to give yes. them lots. And this comes back to what I've talked about before with strength-based learning. We want to spend the majority of our time in their strengths. And then like yes. you said, I love that, you know, easy plus one in their weaknesses. So they're not getting overwhelmed. They're not getting burnt out. Mm-hmm. They're not getting frustrated. They're just pushing a little bit more and a little bit more each day. So they're building that stamina I was writing a post for Simple Homeschool recently, just kind of about our day in the life. And one of the things I talked about was Isaac is doing a language arts workbook. Mm -hmm. It's not because he needs a language arts workbook. It's not actually even because I subscribe to giving my kids lots of workbooks. It's to build his stamina for following through on something someone else gives him that he doesn't want to do. So it's persistence. A page (laughs) is easy. So he's doing two pages right now. I love it growing because it's not about the language arts skills. It's about building the stamina to follow Mm. through on a task, even when you don't want to. And so remembering that our job is to build our kids up, feed into the strengths and passions and interests, and then work on those when they're confident because of those, of the, the gifts that we're giving them. I love that. I love how I'm going to borrow something from, you know, the esteemed frozen where they, (laughs) you know, they said, just take the next best step or the next right thing actually, I think is what they, I think it is. I love that song. Yeah. Right. So, and it's so true. I mean, we want to think about what are they doing really well right now? Look at the next step, not far, far, far in the future where you're going to be a writer, but okay. So right now you can write one word or two words or anything like that. Great. One letter, one line down. All of it's okay. You can draw a picture. Fantastic. That's working some of those same skills. So wonderful. Let's start where you are and not with the whole end in mind, but the next, next right thing, the next step. Perfect. 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 And those persistent. So executive functioning skills also lead into handwriting. So if we're, th- you know, we just talked first about the motor skills piece. I want to talk a little bit about the cognition and yeah, I mean, even also, well, let me back up because we're not quite done with motor <laughs> skills. There's also visual motor skills, which really matter. And then we'll go into cognition. So visual motor skills, this is a huge piece because 
There is just the hardware of your eyes, you know, you being able to move your eyes from left to right to visually scan. If you're asking to copy, you have to look at something in front of you and then look down. So those muscles have to be accurate. We have to, and their stamina as well. If we think about, so my son's story, he his eyes were not strong enough to be working together all the time. So what would happen was he would be perceiving out of one eye and then his eye would get tired and then his brain is perceiving what's happening in the other eye. Interesting. Yeah. So if you think about that, if you just blink your eyes for a second, it looks like everything is moving on the page, which is what he literally thought. I mean, when he asked me once when we were working on him learning how to read and he was like, mom, how do you learn to read? When the words are moving on the page. It's crazy. Right. But here's the really interesting thing about it is that he literally did not know that the words were not moving on the page because that's what he's always seen. Kids don't know to say like, mom, this looks weird because that's what they've always seen. Right. So we have to be very intentional about questioning things like, hmm, I see you closing one eye. Do you ever see double vision? or see two, they don't know double vision. Do you ever right. see two of something? Or does it look blurry on the page? You might see kids kind of rubbing their eyes. You know, does it seem like you're getting a headache or are your eyes getting tired? If you're looking from one thing to another, does it wiggle or jump? I mean, you have to be really specific about those questions because that vision piece is absolutely 100% imperative for being able to write handwrite. And again, that's the piece that we'll link back to for the OT is in because we really, it's a whole month that we're spending on that in, on that OT is in podcast. So that was your brief, like two minute excerpt of vision. <laughs> and now let's think about the cognitive piece. It is really important that our kids understand the purpose of writing. So Oftentimes they'll see you reading, right? If you're reading aloud, great, all of that. They may not know the opposite is the same. So in essence, that the words that they are saying correspond to the letters that are written on the page. So narration, so where you take exactly what they're saying and write it down and then you know, you could pause and be like, guys, what you're saying is so important. I really want to make sure that I have it written here in my notebook. When that happens, they're seeing you write something, which just that modeling, which also make sure you make a mistake in there and cross it out because they also need to see mistakes are okay, especially with a new task like that. So spell oh, a word yeah. wrong, cross it out and move on. Hey there. Okay, so you've heard me talk about CTC math a lot on this podcast and in my newsletter because CTC is the math program we use and we love. I am a subscriber. I paid for my own subscription. I've been a customer for years. My children use it. I love CTC because it's adaptable. It is taught to mastery. It shows you their mastery level. You can move on when kids learn something. You can go backwards if they need extra help with something. You can do a couple grade levels in a year if you need to. You can skip grade levels. Every subscription includes access to K through calculus. So you can use whatever part you need. You don't have to be locked in to one grade level. I love, love, love that. I also love the people behind the company. They stand behind their, pro their product. If at any point you feel CTC is not working out for you, reach out to them and they will help you. They will get you squared away. They will help figure it out so you can be successful. And if you still don't think it's going to work for you, they'll give you your money back. You really can't lose using this program. It's the best there is. It really, truly is. It's the most adaptable, the most cost effective, and the greatest people. So check them out, ctcmath.com, and let them know I sent you because uh, I want them to know how much we appreciate them. People have written in, like my friend Carol, to tell me that they are grateful that they that they heard about CTC math because they had a kiddo who just wasn't moving forward. And by being able to kind of game the system and skip the areas that they already knew and move ahead towards other grade levels and complete a couple in a year made 
their kid motivated. And so Carol reached out to tell me that she was grateful that she'd heard about CTC. If you have a story like Carol, I'd love for you to share it with me. Just hit reply in any of my newsletters or go over to the show notes for this episode where you can find a link to CTC Math and you can find a link to my contact page so you can reach out and let me know what you think about them because I would love to hear who else is finding success with CTC. If you're having any trouble with the program, reach out to CTC because they're great and they will help you in any way you need. All right, check them out, ctcmath.com, and let's get back with today's episode. I want to just interject with that because so many of my listeners have perfectionistic kids or are perfectionistic themselves, right? And the very best way to combat that if it's already kind of entrenched in your family's dynamic is for you to make mistakes and normalize them. Mm -hmm. And like, I've had so many parents say, but you want me to force mistakes? Absolutely. Yep. I sure do. I don't need to know that you're making it up. Like drop an egg on the floor and suck it up. You've got to clean it. Mm -hmm. You know, you need to be making mistakes. You need to write the wrong word. You need to erase. Mm -hmm. You need to write something and show that, oh, I wrote the wrong thing. It needs to be edited now because it's the only way to normalize that you learn from failure and you learn from mistake. And we want to make sure that that is normalized for our kids. Yes. 100%. So write it down, cross it out and keep on going and, or even make a comment. Wow. I spelled that wrong. Or, Hey, that looks weird. How do I actually spell that? Or did I, did I write that? Does that S look the way that it should look to you? You know, talk about that, acknowledge it sometimes maybe even write a letter backwards, you know, things like that, because we want our children to know that when they're practicing, yes, they will improve and improve, improve, but mistakes are inevitable. So let's do it. So as you're, you know, writing for them, talk about what you've heard them say. So repeat it back and say, I just want to make sure that I've got this right. You know, Julie Bogart talks about this a lot in her Jot It Down curriculum. I think that's a fantastic spot. But even if, you know, one of my daughters has a, one of my daughters, I only have one, my daughter, <laughs> what have I been Speaking doing? family here? members now. Yeah, right? She has a family quote board, which now she keeps in her phone, but she pulls it up all the time and just laughs about things that we've said or done and, That way we've got a connection Mm -hmm. to what the writing is, which is important. We want to know, we want you to know that your words are valuable and they're valuable longer than just, you know, what you can, you know, say in that moment. They're valuable that we want to come back and to review them. So that's a cognitive portion of it, the actual purpose. Now, (laughs) cognition as far as executive functioning skills. So any task that, you know, a functional task requires us to execute it. That's why they're executive functioning. And we've talked about this numerous times on this podcast. So I'm sure, I mean, me and the links on this page are going to be. It's great. (laughs) I love it. (laughs) Me too. Me too. Because it really just, it shows that everything really goes together. You know, our, we're not, handwriting is not just an isolated thing and us being able to start and finish something is not an isolated thing. You know, we are full beings, Mm -hmm. you know, in essence, we are born persons, like Charlotte Mason says, it all just goes together. So executive functioning with this, you have to initiate a task. And when writing comes along, it can be that you're having to initiate every single letter if motor planning or those fine motor skills are not are are one of the weaker areas so we need to think about that it's each little task and how much we're requiring of brain power there so task initiation attention and attention if your vision is one of the weaker areas that is way harder so again, we're putting all of this together the emotional control so how we feel about how hard something is for us to persist through of the task that we got started, see how they all flow. That's also an executive functioning skill. So it requires so much. Again, with executive functioning is organization. Now, when you think of organization, you're like, all right, like make sure my supplies are together. Yes. But in addition to that, there's an, there's an order with writing. You know, we have to start from the left and go to the right. You have to stay on your line or oriented in this one direction. You need to know your directionality words. So also prepositions. So things like if I'm going to make a line down, what is 
down mean? <laughs> All of these are organizational thoughts. What comes first? Okay, so I need my big line down, then my little curve or whatever. Within those, that's also organization and directionality. So if that is a struggle, you need to start there. Start with playing Simon Says and, and start with, there's a great Dr. Seuss game where you have to pick up a cake and hold it under your arm and walk around a circle, you know, that's using all of these up, around, down, through all of those prepositional phrases, which can help our children. It's so funny when I hear this, I, okay. And so I guess this is mom for moms of multiple age kids. Mm -hmm. I think back to all of the things I did, especially with my older two that I'm not doing with my younger two. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. we would play the preposition game where I just say like, okay, go under the table, go on the table, go to the left of the table. I don't right. think I've ever done that with my younger, my younger, my youngest for sure. Yeah. But those kinds of super simple things can go a long way towards mm -hmm. what we're talking about, making those connections because those connections really are across the board. Handwriting Absolutely. is not just opening a book and writing things down. It crosses Absolutely. so many different boundaries. And do you know what? I bet your older kids, I keep laughing because my youngest who is eight, I keep saying he's being raised by wolves because Seriously. it's like my old stuff that comes out of his mouth. I'm like, oh my if my God. oldest was eight and said those things, I'd be like, what on earth? Uh -huh. But <laughs> he's, he's being raised by teenagers as well. You know, not that they're in charge of him, but for sure. Anyway, no, I digress. But <laughs> it's, it's a completely different thing. Cause I think this is actually a good digression because it also will go to those parents who are struggling, like thought that they had it all together. And now they've got this little one and they're like, well, I did this three times already. Why can't mm -hmm. I do this with this one? But I was having this conversation with my 14 year old yesterday that I said to her, cause she, she was talking about how she feels she's doing more chores than others right mm -hmm. now. And I said, you are, you absolutely yeah. are. There was a time when your older brother was doing more chores because he was the only one that could. And then there was a time when your older sister was and now it's kind of your turn because she's yeah, busy and it'll turn. eventually be Isaac's turn. I said, but you have to remember too, all of you have a very different upbringing. Trevor was an only child for a while. You and Molly were never and never will right, be. Right. And then Isaac will be, he'll be an only child at home, like for several years after you go away to school. Right. Yes. And that's very, very different. So their upbringing is absolutely different. And the things that come out of their mouth and the things that they don't do because in your head, you've done them already, but you haven't done them with that one. I think that's perfectly normal. And I want to make sure that moms who are listening and are feeling like they failed their youngest, you haven't. It's just, it's a different type of parenting. And so next right step, right? You yep, can't do what you don't right know thing. or don't recognize. So you just do the next thing. Absolutely. So the good thing to know is that your older children are probably naturally doing some of those things with your younger ones. So if they're going outside and they're playing sports together, you know, they're saying, kick the ball in the net or, you know, good job or throw, throw the ball at me. That was too low. You know, they're giving some of those same things that we had to do for our older ones. Now, also, if you're doing stuff like climbing a tree or, you know, this doesn't have to be like, wow, I'm setting aside my day to make sure that I'm I'm using these prepositions, right? Just sometimes narrate what they're doing. Wow, I just saw you climb up that tree and you went out on the branch to the left. Wow, where did you put your foot? You know, just if you are thinking that that might be a piece of the puzzle that's missing, be intentional with your words and then it will come together. Doesn't always have to be these big giant, like, okay, this is what I have to do next to remediate or whatever. Just be simple and add, add some simple things into your day. Yeah. It's about intentionality and not another curriculum or another yes. half an hour lesson or whatever. So much can be integrated into what you're already doing mm -hmm. with just a couple easy, quick sentences. Absolutely. And then, you know, handwriting and social skills are going together in that same moment. So you're actually look back at your day and all the things you've done and be like, how did I work on handwriting today? Oh, <laughs> we were cooking in the kitchen and we opened all the bags and that was the motor skill part. And then we were, you know, cleaning and pushing the vacuum. And that was the core strength part. And we went outside and we were playing and we talked about that. We saw the bird flying around the tree and that was working on handwriting. All right. There you go. <laughs> it doesn't all have to be the actual task of handwriting. Just know you're building up to it. I love that. 
All right. So we've had the, the fine motor and the core strength and the executive function skills, the cognition, anything else? And the visual motor, we added all of that stuff too. So those are our main pieces of the puzzle, but we have to remember that they all come together simultaneously when you are writing. So that takes planning, which again is an executive functioning skill, but not only is it that planning, but it's the whole motor planning. And so, and that's just to write a letter. Then you're moving on to how do I turn this letter into a sentence which progresses from copy work onto my own idea. Now I have to take that and turn it into a paragraph and wait, I need to remember about punctuation and about and about spelling and all this. So you see how much of our brain that you're using at any time. And then wait, is it actually even necessary to write? Like let's think about where does that fit in? See, so 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 many different pieces that we can't even continue to, you know, delve all the way down. But I, I do want to tackle this, is writing actually important? Because that is a big number two question that also comes along with that, especially as kids start getting a little bit older and they're like, you know what, we've tried this. I, I'm, you know, my kid's nine and 10 and I didn't know about the vision piece. And do we go all the way back to that? Or do we just kind of accommodate? From an OT perspective, the research shows that it really The actual motor task of writing, because it's adding in another sense, especially when you are listening to something being said. So I'm thinking about taking notes here, right? Right. So if we're adding in that extra sense, it really helps with memory and recall and attention while it's happening. So while you're there. So, however, I simultaneously want to say that if it's really hard for writing, then it would be taking your attention away from what is happening to have that task there. So this is really a person by person decision. I would spend time on both on actually writing so that, cause we don't want to remove that option, but we want to provide the least restrictive. So if handwriting is more restrictive then we want to have the other option. Are you recording, you know, the lesson? Are you, I just got my son a camera that prints out to a sticker oh, yeah. so that he can take a picture of, you know, something that's up on the board or whatever. Um, in his co-op recently, they've been doing anatomy. And so we took a picture of, you know, what someone drew on the board and it came out in a sticker and he put that sticker right in his notebook and he can label like small words, but it's not this huge thing. Right. His more of his task is not spent on the actual writing, but his brain capacity is on taking in that information. And that's something he can do later on if he is, you know, going to college or in a meeting at work or, you know, something like that. We want to practice these skills where they can start to advocate for them. So my answer is not a push away handwriting and just begin, you know, typing or, or talk to text or whatever but focus on both simultaneously so that we know that you are able to pick the one that fits in that environment the best. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that is a really important thing to remember when it comes to just living in general, you want a balance of the things that, that they're going to need. I mean, they need to be able to read handwriting Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. write things. They're going to have to sign papers Mm -hmm. and checks Mm -hmm. and fill things out because they're still old school ways of doing things. Mm -hmm. But then if they are someone like my oldest is not a writer and that's always been a difficult task for him. Well, he can write, Mm -hmm. but the majority of the time he chooses to talk to text. And when he took the English class at the college, he dictated his essays and, and then went in and edited them. And when he was in class and had to write things out, he talked to his teacher and said that the act of writing is very difficult for me. And so she let him bring in a keyboard so he could type yeah. things as he was right or as he was in. So letting them know how to helping them know how to how to do things mm-hmm. and what accommodations are appropriate for what settings and then how they can advocate for themselves when they need those accommodations. All of that is important. And I think a really crucial holistic approach to helping your kids who struggle lean into their strengths while advocating for their weaknesses and being able to accommodate for them. Absolutely. And even as we're, you're doing these observations when they're younger, or even, you know, as they're older, if you're observing and saying, wait, I think you're really struggling because you don't have the endurance or you're struggling because 
right now your your eyes seem to be giving you a headache, whatever. You know, you're making these observations. You're able to then give them the words so that they can advocate. Because the more that they know about themselves, you know, the self-awareness that breeds self-advocacy. Mm-hmm. So those observation skills are really, really, really important now. And, you know, for for them, ask the questions. Why? Why is this hard? What is coming? What do you feel about this? And they can hopefully begin to tell you some of those answers. I love that. All right. Anything else you want to add to this huge topic that we've encapsulated into about 40 minutes? I know. (laughs) Just that we know it's a huge topic and we have encapsulated it. So like I said, some... We've given lots of other resources that, you know, yeah. the rainbow resources about the curriculums there, you know, on the podcast on OT is in, we're going to link to some of the blogs too, but also there is a focus group, which really delves into more and more of these things of these specific aspects and how we can address each of them. And that's also on homeschool OT. Can you tell handwriting is one of my favorite things? Like I have all of this. Let's talk about it all. (laughs) Well, it's important and you're filling a need that is out there. And again, you're filling it at multiple levels. So if someone needs more intense help, Mm -hmm. they can go into the focus group and get, you know, one-on-one and group help. And if they just need a couple ideas, they can go watch the videos or or read a blog post. So everyone listening, you've got lots of options too. It's not, you don't have to go buy a bunch of curriculums or pay for one-on-one consultations, but they're available if you need them and the free resources aren't enough. And know that like when people ask me, you know, should I be doing a coaching call or a consultation? I say, what have you tried first? Mm, You know, try the things first. There's so many resources out there to help you. And then if you're still feeling like it's just not clicking, I'm missing something, well, that's when you take the next step. And that way you're not always feeling like you're failing because you're not, you're not, right. you're, you're advocating, you're listening, you're listening to this podcast to be a better homeschool mom. <laughs> like you're already winning at this. So yes. And you're building your team. That's the thing. When you you know, whenever you are consulting or you're bringing in others, it's not that you're saying, wow, you're the expert. I don't know what is right. going on, but it's like, Hey, I'm the expert in my team or in my child. And I want to add this, like you may be the expert in handwriting or whatever. So let's pair our expertise together. And that you're already doing partially by listening to this podcast, right? But then there is more, like we are here to support. That That's the overarching goal, I think, of both of us, of OT is in and, and the homeschool OT, and then also of raising lifelong learners is we really just want to make sure that you as homeschool families are supported. Absolutely. All right. Last parting words of support or encouragement or whatever for all of those moms out there struggling with handwriting. Ah, I feel like you always put me on the spot. I, know, I love Sarah, it. you said all but this I, stuff. What do you I think? I get some really important? good things from you that way. <laughs> I think remembering that, yes, you are the expert in your child, but play the detective as part of that. So ask the questions, observe, really look at okay, what is going really well? And make sure that you acknowledge that. And what is hard? And when you're asking those questions to yourself or to your child, because it probably should be both, then we can start to figure out what are the next steps that you can do the next right thing. (laughs) And then sing Frozen. (laughs) <laughs> and then sing that together. See, this is why I put you on the spot because you have these profound sound bites that I get to share with everybody. So oh, thank you. Fancy. <laughs> I love that. All right. So we'll link to Sarah's podcast, Sarah's resources on handwriting and all of our past episodes. So you can catch up on all the Sarah Collins goodness on the podcast in the show notes for this episode. And I appreciate you being here. Thank you so much. I appreciate you having me. And I, I just really love your... Do you know, I got someone recently who sent me a message that was like, I heard you on the Raising Lifelong Learners podcast and I love it when you're there. And I was like, me too. I love, <laughs> I love it. I love it when I'm there. It was really, it was such a sweet comment. That's so fun. So thank you, whoever said that. That's I know. Great. I love, love having Sarah here too. She's my favorite. All right. So thank you all for listening. I appreciate you. You have so many different places that you can go and so many different podcasts to listen to, but you're spending time here. So I appreciate that. I'll be back same time, same place next week with another episode and enjoy your kids this week. Watch them, observe them, but more just have fun with them. 
your homeschooling. Enjoy the process of that. I'll talk to y'all soon. Bye for now.